Today on Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape. I am grieving my father's death. My mother brought a man with her to a meeting about the estate that is so insulting to my father. Your father's dead. His feelings don't matter. Max! Susanna, you made a big scene in the lobby. You made your point. I don't like this weepy, weepy, wah wah thing you're doing. I don't respect it. I read about these families. Craziest thing, Max. When someone in the family is in pain, the other family members do this thing called nurture. You ever heard of that? Nope. It's not a distinction, Susanna. A parent's death, it is the most common of milestones. Let me tell you something. Susanna can be fixed. I'm not worried about Susanna. Your financial health, on the other hand... Lester and I will meet you downstairs. We'll share a meal and some good wine. We'll talk business in the morning. From Wondery, this is Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape. I'm your host, David Reinstrom. What's your secret? My secret is that I like to make sandwiches with non-sandwich items, like soup. This week, we will begin a new series. Gina John Frieda's Becky Shaw, a 2009 finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. This is a comedy about an incredibly mixed up family. Some, some truly horrible people, but nonetheless hilarious in their dysfunction and self-absorption. Enter unsuspecting Becky Shaw. She's got some problems of her own, but I'm not sure she's ready for this family dynamic. I don't want to give away too much, but suffice it to say this is not for the kids. Now, this episode is going to sound a little different from what you've heard previously on SCA because it was recorded in front of a live audience. So don't be alarmed if you hear people laughing along with you. In our first episode, we meet Susanna, Max, and Susan. Brace yourself. This is one wacky bunch. stabbed 37 times. The serration pattern explained the blood formation on the floor of the crime scene. Oh. There was massive hemorrhaging and death was swift. Hey, I'm watching that. He strangled her. She's not coming home. Turn it back on. No, I cut you off. Remember, you're not allowed to watch that stuff. It soothes me, and I need it. Don't judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm disciplining you. I did nothing wrong. My mother is the one who Stop. showed up. I just spent 40 minutes calming your mother down, and she will be here soon. You need to be a big girl and face your big girl problems. No more dead prostitutes on the autopsy channel until you do that. Why do you have a key to my room? Because I paid for it. Oh, did you pay for my mom's room, too? Yes. Because we're poor now? That's what we're all going to talk about at dinner. Your mother will be here soon. I've decided I won't see her. Excuse me, what? I am grieving my father's death. My mother brought a man with her to a meeting about the estate that is so insulting to my father. Your father's dead. His feelings don't matter. Max! Susanna, you made a big scene in the lobby. You made your point. I won't See her. So how's this gonna work? I go to dinner with your mother and her man friend. You stay here and cry while she takes all the money? You would never let that happen. You know, I might. I don't like this weepy, weepy, wah wah thing you're doing. I don't respect it. Max, I'm grieving. Negotiations are all about who has the biggest dick in the room. <laughs> Be sad, grieve, but do it with a big dick. Grieve with a big dick. That's not possible. Uh, Charles Bronson and Death Wish. <laughs> Rambo, Mrs. Voorhees and Friday the 13th. None of those people are real, Max. Susanna, you gotta pull it together. Clock strikes midnight, you can regress. Light your vanilla candle and write in your dream journal. Until then, you're a soldier. Fix yourself up. <sighs> in one of my textbooks, I read about these families. Craziest thing, Max. When someone in the family is in pain, the other family members do this thing called nurture. You ever heard of that? Nope. No crying. Big dick. <laughs> okay, so, clean slate. Last few hours never happened. 
I'd like to welcome my two favorite ladies to New York City. We're all so glad we're here because we love each other so much, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm going to suggest that we stick to the original plan. I never suggested otherwise. You brought Lester. The plan did not include Lester. Susanna, I'm disabled. I can't travel alone. I offered to drive to Richmond and pick you up. I don't feel safe in a car with you. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. It hurts my feelings, Susan. I taught her to drive. I'm not blaming you. Susanna has assumed a somber attitude since her father died. So I can't drive? If a drunk driver is careening into my path, I don't want my life in your hands. I'm sorry. Susanna's attitude is not the point. Lester is not the point. Lester is the point. I am not going to discuss my father's estate with your... whatever he is to you, in addition to being your house painter. He's my lover. Oh, my God. <laughs> How could you? Listen to me. Your father died six months it ago. It was three months. Four, it was four months. You're both liars. <laughs> you didn't lose a child or even a breast. Your father died of natural causes after a life well lived. That's not loss, it's transition. How can you? It's a huge loss. It's an old man dying peacefully. It's not tragic. He was my dad. And you're an adult. This, this is a costume. W what, my clothes? The black dress. You're infatuated with your grief. You think you finally found something that will distinguish you. OK, that's enough. It's not a distinction, Susanna. A parent's death, it is the most common of milestones. My proposal is that we keep to the plan. We go to dinner. We talk facts and figures. Lester can join us for dessert. No, I won't leave him sitting in the room while we're having our nice dinner. See, this is the point. It's not going to be a nice dinner, Susan. We're here to talk about your finances. I don't discuss money at the dinner table. You grew up in my household. You know that. Oh, no, no. You agreed to this. I agreed to hear your opinions. They're not opinions. I'm perfectly willing to have a conversation about the estate, but not over dinner. Susanna, some women, Marilyn Monroe, Princess Diana, are sensual in grief. You are not. <laughs> Max! Susan, please. Do you disagree? Look at her. Let me tell you something. Susanna can be fixed. I'm not worried about Susanna. <laughs> Your financial health, on the other hand... Lester and I will meet you downstairs. We'll share a meal and some good wine. We'll talk business in the morning. No, I don't have time in the morning, Susan. And you can't afford good wine. Are you enjoying this drama you've created? Your husband created it. I am just the messenger. This is terribly exhilarating for you. I can see it. Mom. How can you? You and Richard raised me, Susan. For all practical purposes, you're my parents. And that only makes it crueler. You think I take pleasure in this? I would be a monster. Not a monster, a power monger. I know that look. What look? This look? <laughs> That is the look you get when my family's stupidity offers you a foothold to gain power. Anytime I can clean up after your family's stupidity, I am happy to do it. Stop it. What is this? Your family, my family, we're... This is our family. How broke are we? I think we should drink some alcohol. <laughs> Lester is hungry. Whatever you want to say, you may say now or in the morning. I have a full day tomorrow. Then say it now, cogently, please. Do not savor. The business hasn't turned a profit in nearly a decade. Richard burned through a lot of your savings, patching holes, keeping it afloat. I think it was largely sentimental. It's an old family business. He hoped the tide would turn. Are we broke? No, but your savings are thin. I have a plan I would like to propose. I have a very hard time believing this, Max. Yoshi would certainly have told Yoshi me. Yoshi lost his objectivity. He'll be the first to admit that. Nonsense. He's a Japanese businessman. His objectivity is all he has. Mom, that's racist. Oh. <laughs> Send me the figures. I will show them to my financial advisor. Your financial advisor is Yoshi. Correct. <laughs> Yoshi no longer wishes to be involved. Because you bullied him in your zeal to seize power. I'll bring him back. There's no power to seize, Susan. Look, Yoshi asked me. There was a loss of objectivity. In your opinion. In reality on planet Earth. <laughs> your husband was stupid about his money and his financial advisor was. There was a romantic situation and I'm sorry. Oh, you are 
devious. Romantic? He means homosexual. I don't think we need to get into labels. Gay? Bi. Let's say your father was bi. You don't believe in bisexuality. I'm very upset with you, Max. Me? Lester and I will be having dinner privately and returning to Richmond. Susan, you got to face this. I hope you enjoyed yourself, Max. You could have done this in an email, as I begged you to do. Susanna, you're welcome to join us for dinner if you're prepared to apologize to Lester for your dramatics. Mom, you need to stay with me and deal with this. Oh, no good deed goes unpunished. You, Max, were a good deed. I know that. I took you into my home. Mom, stop. You did. I owe your family a debt, and I'm ready to start repaying it tonight. Let me help you. Oh, please. I manage money for a living, Susan. I make people rich. You could do worse than having me. You, you are a rich man who puts his family in a two-star hotel. That's what you are. You're going to have to hire someone else to do this. There's, there's too much history. This is a three-star hotel. <laughs> Max, I'm sorry. I think the MS is catching up to her. Since when does she run from a shitstorm? She likes other people's shitstorms. This is too close. Is that it? You know, the day of my mother's funeral, she bought me a suit. I'm 10 years old. I've met her, like, once. Mm -hmm. She took me to the fat child department at Sears. She said... Your mother is dead, and your father dresses you like a gay hustler. <laughs> Max, that's awful. Why have you never told me that? Yeah, it was awful at the time, but she saved me from walking into my mother's funeral looking like a gay hustler. Everybody else was blubbering all over themselves. She's the only person who had my back. Your dad and Yoshi, you either knew or you surmised. You barely reacted, and given what a fucking drama queen you are. I was counting on a deathbed last scene where I would ask him. You were saving the hard questions until he was too feeble to run? It's not like that. Did you know? I knew there was something. A factor X that would explain him. A, a, I figured he was gay or impotent or he killed a drifter and your mother had proof so he couldn't leave. <laughs> God, I should have asked him. Well, he just would have denied it. He was a lying, denying kind of guy. Don't say that. He was a liar and a denier and the greatest man I've ever known. Your parents complimented each other. Your father denied problems. Your mother rubbed your face in them. He did not deny. My father had an appropriate grasp of how much a child could handle. Right. He lied. That's what parents are supposed to do, dumbass. Lie to children? Yes. He lied to me about my mother's illness until I was old enough to deal with it, and that was a gift. A gift? You can't tell an eight-year-old that her mother has MS. Susie, he told you she was an alcoholic, and she wasn't. <laughs> he never said alcoholic. He said sometimes mommy drinks too much, and that makes her drop things. Well, you're going to graduate school in psychology. Get some feedback on that episode and get back to me. Max, there are times when lying is the most humane thing you can do. I see. Your father spends his life being humane. He leaves me to be the asshole. I'm sorry. It's not fair no, to you. No, it's fair. I owe him something. He was generous to me beyond all reason. He was generous to you because he adored you. Well, when my father and I showed up at your house to say my mother had died, both of your parents said, I'm sorry, Matt. They said, Max, you misheard them. It's fine. I know I was your dad's good deed. I mean, it wasn't pure charity. He thought an orphan in the house would make your mother behave better. Well, that's true, but it didn't work, did it? She stayed evil, and he kept you anyway. <laughs> because he loved you. It was a bold move, adopting a child to shame your wife into being less abusive. That took some balls. Can I finish graduate school? Yes. You're not rich anymore, but you're not the fucking Jodes. So what do we do? Sell the company, sell the house. Your mother can get a full-service apartment. They carry the groceries, they clean. The rest of her needs, Lester can pick up the slack. L Lester is the slack? He's a rent boy. Yes, he is, and it's honest work. No, it isn't. Lester will do everything your father did for your mother. Whatever his price, it's worth it. No. What's your solution? You gonna move home and help her? God, no. She needs to hire someone. The money isn't there, Susanna. Her health is going to decline, and Lester is a decent guy. He's dumb, and he's our age. He's not dumb. 
He's a redneck, but he's, he's a sort of alternative redneck. Who wants to make a movie? Oh, so that's why he's with her? Fuck that. You want your freedom? Open your eyes. Your freedom is Rent Boys and Redneck Cinema. You are talking about prostitution. Prostitution, marriage, same thing. <laughs> it's two people coming together because each has something the other wants. Boy, you don't believe in love. Sure I do. Love is a happy byproduct of use. A happy byproduct of use. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> Susanna, we're animals. Love is just, it's a feeling, like hunger, like cold. It's a feeling that tells you what you need to survive. A sandwich, a sweater, an orphan, a Lester. Stop calling yourself an orphan. Do you think all love is use or just romantic love? All love. Your father, for example, paid our college tuition. We, in turn, loved him very much. I hate when you do this. Do what? Turn a beautiful thing to shit. Understanding behavior is not turning it to shit. Oh, you're saying my father was generous with us because he couldn't love men, is that it? I think if your father had been more self-actualized, I'd have college loans. I do believe that. I don't, and now I want to stop talking about this. You're getting a PhD in psychology. How are you so totally unwilling to ask the hard questions? I ask them when it's necessary, when there's no problem. It's like shoving your face in the toilet after you shit. You can do it, but it's not necessary. Wow, you're gonna make an interesting therapist. I'm proud of you. I just told you you're broke and you have a gay dad. And you're... I feel like I can go to bed and not worry about you. You worry about me since when? Of course I worry about you. You're a mess. My father's only been dead three months. It's four months. God! It's long enough to grieve. You have too much time on your hands. I'm in a PhD program, Max. In psychology. If you had gone to medical school like I told you to, you couldn't call me crying. You'd be too busy saving lives. Am I inconveniencing you by calling? I'll stop. Call me all you want. I can't help you. You need to take action. I'm in therapy. That's not action. That's wallowing. What's your idea of action? Uh, things you do outside your home that require you to move your limbs. You need to join some clubs. Clubs? What kind of clubs? Clubs! The KKK! <laughs> the Daughters of the American Revolution! You need activities so that when you get mopey, mopey, weepy, weepy, you can abort the thoughts. You can say, I don't have time for this. I have a barn raising I need to jog to. <laughs> Oh, Max, cut me some slack. Dad was my anchor in the world. I feel totally untethered. Right. You need to fucking tether yourself. Join like a powder puff girl on girl softball team. Do something. I don't know. I think maybe there's value in just sitting with it. This feeling of floating alone in the universe. Maybe I'm supposed to learn something from it. You've had four months. You haven't learned anything. I'm talking about life lessons, Max. It's not like learning Photoshop. So when you call me at 3 a.m. saying you want to be dead, I should say, be very still, Susanna, and reflect on your pain. That doesn't help you. It's not either or, Max. You can offer empathy. You're paying a therapist for empathy, and you're still calling me saying some very scary things. They are normal impulses, and they pass. I hope so. They're hard to listen to. I need to go to bed. Now? It's so early. I go to work at 7. I need to be in bed by 10, which gives me... Just enough time for takeout and pornography. Let's order food here. Uh, well, can we watch pornography? I don't know. I feel like our father is sort of like in the room. He wasn't our father. I have an actual living father who would be very hurt to hear you say that. How is he? I don't want to talk about that. That bad, huh? No, it's just, it's more complicated financial stuff. Oh, he's not going to go to jail again, is he? It's enough family drama for one night. Oh, sorry. Not only do we all dump our problems on you, they're not even interesting problems. It's all math. Math I can do. A little Japanese man crying all over me in a Starbucks. Yoshi! <laughs> wow. Was he super sad? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I want you to call your mother tomorrow and suggest that someone other than me do this. I, I know you're in your sad Buddhist phase. I but... will call her. So, let's pick some activities right now. Al-Anon.
Unitarianism, the Green Party, what are you going to do? I don't know. There's a grad school ski trip next week. Go. I don't ski. It's cheap, though. Go. Go skiing. Get a dog. Kiss a girl. Shake things up. No dogs. <laughs> but skiing, I would try. Great. Now let's watch pornography. <laughs> Remember that big porn superstore we used to drive past on the way to the mall? <laughs> I remember the day I saw the word amateur on the marquee for the first time. You were driving, and I said... Who wants to watch sexual amateurs? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it meant, like, people who didn't know what they were doing. I remember. You ever watch the amateur stuff? A little. Okay, so you know what these amateurs look like. They're not all fat and ugly, Max. That's just not true. It is true. The hot amateurs are being paid, so they're not really amateurs. Yeah, I can't watch that. Girls in this country illegally and addicted to drugs. What consenting adults do to get into this country and stay here is not my problem. I didn't say it was. Relax. The, the true amateurs are fat couples with cameras and no shame. They're disgusting. I hate them. Well, that's the only porn I can watch. All the rest... I feel too responsible, you know? No. See, you are why civilization is going to end. <laughs> you would choose a disgusting reality over a beautiful fiction. <laughs> I don't understand that. I want the love boat. I do not want a real boat with real lovers. <laughs> the love boat. <laughs> wow. Remember? The Saturday your mom died, we watched that on TV while my parents got your dad drunk. Not really. We did a thousand-piece puzzle and watched the love boat. Wait, the puzzle? Was it porpoises or something? It was a whale. <laughs> I remember the love boat ending and my dad's footsteps. And I thought, it's over. Max has to go home. And I prayed that wouldn't happen. What do you mean you prayed? I prayed. I said, please, God, don't let this end. I didn't pray for your mom to be alive or my mom to be not sick. I prayed for more time with you. And my prayer got answered. Dad came around the corner with hot chocolate. We passed out during Fantasy Island. <laughs> I don't remember any of that. Let's watch TV. I don't want to watch porn, though. Fine. How about horror? Oh, yes, please. Can you find some? I can try. Now I want hot chocolate. Hot chocolate and horror. That is what I want more than anything in the world. Don't pray, or if you do, don't squander it. Pray for money. I would never pray for money. Okay, okay, here, look. Nightmare on Elm Street. But, but, which one? Hundred bucks if you know. It's, oh, give me a second. It, it, it's three. <laughs> Freddy's about to say, where's the bourbon, bitch? Uh, you're right, good call. <laughs> Where's the fucking bourbon? <laughs> like, it's not bad enough he has knives for fingers. He has to be verbally abusive. <laughs> I saw a rock concert at Jones Beach last year. It was late at night and freezing, even though it was summer. And they didn't sell booze, so I drank hot chocolate. That's it? That's the whole story? Yeah. That's not a story. That's a setup for a story. It's a snapshot, an exhilarating moment. If that was exhilarating, you left a part out. I asked the concessions guy why they didn't sell booze, and he said that a girl had been struck by lightning the year before, so they stopped serving booze. <laughs> that makes absolutely no sense. The guy next to me bought a Coke, and the concessions guy poured it out of the bottle into a cup. And again, I asked why. And he said that somebody had thrown a bottle on stage the night before and hit the singer in the head, so no more bottles. Oh, okay. I got it. The point. Fantastic. I had this moment, this wave of exhilaration came over me, and the exhilaration was feeling it was worth it. People getting struck by lightning and whacked in the head with bottles. A certain amount of brutality was worth it to see a rock concert next to the ocean. The night your mom died felt like that. You know? 
My mother was sick, yours was dead, but I felt so happy to be with you. Maybe that's how life works, you know? <laughs> All these hideous things, but you get little pockets of joy to get you through. Rock concerts on the ocean, puzzles and TV. Mm. Max, I, I, I can't. You're my brother. I'm not your brother. I think your mother hammered that point home. Okay, you're my money manager. I am. Keep kissing me. I might take that responsibility seriously. I can't. You don't want to. I really want to. So what's the problem? It's epic. It's... It doesn't have to change anything. Really? Really. Coming up, scenes from the next episode of Becky Shaw, right here on Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape. You know, Max, this is why you don't have a girlfriend. Your mother is why I don't have a girlfriend? Actually, there is probably some truth to that. <laughs> is it all you'd hoped and dreamed of, being married to her? It's great. Look, Susie, you and your mother, it's like the Middle East. Bad situation, not gonna change, so why talk about it? Everyone, this is Becky. Becky, uh, this is my wife, Susanna. This is Max. Uh, let me take your coat. Nice to meet you all, or both. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really feel I'm making a good impression. You're doing great. Please, I'm the one making a bad impression. <laughs> if you're not at your best, it's only because I am not at mine. So you agree I'm not at my best? Oh, dear Becky, you are in for a rough ride. It's gonna get real weird, real fast. I'm not sure I would set Max up with my dog. No, I wouldn't. Dogs are loyal and kind. That would be wrong. Hey, and, and guess what? If you like today's episode, you're in luck, because episode two is coming out tomorrow. We heard that you like getting the first two episodes in a row to binge listen, so go nuts, Secret Keepers. Becky Shaw is written by Gina Gianfrido, who was nice enough to talk to me about this episode. Let's hear a clip of our conversation. Uh, Becky Shaw begins with a kind of gory, true crime drama on Susanna's TV, which she's taking in as a kind of guilty pleasure. Yes. I'm, I'm curious about how you got started in crime fiction, and <clears throat> did working in crime fiction leak over into that first scene? Um, you know, I'm embarrassed to say it was... It just has always been my pleasure reading true crime um, ever since I was in high school. Um, so I think uh, it's my guilty pleasure too. Um, and I think that that first beat was sort of um, a little, little autobiographical. It's sort of uh, the kind of TV I, I turn to when I want to tune out the world and um, not think about my own problems. Um, you know, I, I wrote a whole play about about this whole thing, like a called a, a play called After Ashley, about mm -hmm. um, kind of the ethics of of turning a tragedy into an entertainment. And that's about um, a woman is murdered by a homeless gardener. Yeah, right. yeah, and the um, her husband, who's never had a lot of success with his writing. Um, becomes a little bit of a celebrity uh, by you know, by using the crime to to write write about, um, and this and his son is very upset about that. So it's sort of about um, you know one family member who wants to use the crime to gain fame and one who finds that repellent. Like you do a lot of work in familial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Would that that be an accurate? Yeah, um, I think familial dysfunction and uh, I think romantic relationships. Um, yeah, dysfunction within relationships, familial and otherwise. And I find Susan and Emily Gilmore and um, Lucille Bluth from uh, Arrested Development to all be kind of these imperious women yes. uh, of, a, of a very particularly enjoyable type. They're also acrid. Yes. I'm curious to get your interpretation on why Susan seems not to care that Richard is dead. Um, 
I think that she's she's pragmatic and she sees that his death is appropriate in in terms of the life that it's it's a normal event in a normal life cycle um Mm -hmm. and you know that it's funny now that you mentioned it you know my my own mother died last year but in the in the lead up to it um you know she really uh did not you know I was very very upset obviously and um but she really you know was trying to impress upon me you know she was 86 years old um that she had lived a good life that there was that it really wasn't it wasn't um an event worthy of of you know such such despair I guess I wrote I guess I wrote the 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 scene before I lived it but um I think that uh, the reason Susan is as as uh, cold about it as she is is that she just um, feels like he lived a normal life. He lived, you know, a long life, and mm-hmm. it is what it is. So Richard, the dad, is such a mystery in this play because mm-hmm. he's dead from the very beginning. So we're only ever informed about his life rather than getting to witness it. Right. Um, from your vantage point as the playwright, how do you see that character? What's your what's your read on Richard? Um, my read on him is that he was probably in the closet. I think that um, he's someone who would have would have been an out gay person if his era had made that easier. Um, and I think that he was a warm, loving, wonderful husband and father, but I think um, that heterosexuality was not his actual bent. What makes Max so icy? Why has he kept everyone at such a distance? Um, or would you not say that that is even the case? No, I I think that um, I think he knows I think he knows more than Susan thinks he knows about the his, his father's rejection. Um mm-hmm. I think that that is a very deep wound for him. Um, and I don't know if that's enti- you know entirely the reason, but I, I think there are people, and Max is one, who um, have a very, who look at the world almost as scientists and see, you know, human motivation, almost like watching animals in a zoo. I think that he has, um, it's his nature to um, kind of look at look at human motivation scientifically, which makes him uh, appear a little cold. You know where to get at us. We're at Secrets Crimes on Twitter. Ask us a question, and maybe I'll read it on the show. Use the hashtag Becky Shaw to talk to us about this show and connect with other secret keepers online. Becky Shaw is written by Gina Gianfrido. Episode 1 stars Emily Burgle as Susanna, Marsha Mason as Susan, and Josh Stamberg as Max. It is directed by Bart DiLorenzo. Sound effects artist, Eddie Mills. Music supervisor, Scott Willis. Stage manager, Amanda Allen. Associate producers, Christina Montano and Kathy Reinking. Post-production coordinator, Ron Lipkin. Radio producer, Mike Weisskopf. Sound designer, recording and mixing engineer, Mark Holden for the Invisible Studios, West Hollywood. The producing director of L.A. Theatre Works is Susan Lowenberg. Thank you for listening to Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape. The theme song for our series was composed by Mark Hadley. Our editor is Sergio Enriquez. Our executive producers are Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. Until next time, I'm your host, David Reinstrom. What's your secret?